Greetings, uh, brothers and sisters. Today, I'd like to share a word with you regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And for our reading, I'm going to take some verses from the book of Acts chapter 2 and Luke 24, 49, and then come back to Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. So if I start with Acts chapter 2, and it read thus, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And Luke 24, 49, Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says this, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until he be endued with power from an eye. And the final verse Acts 1 verse 8, again Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says to them, And ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the utmost part of the earth. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this day. Thank you for your words. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to aid us in our work and ministry. I pray that you would bless every listener, every watcher, and bless the words that I will share. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. The passage in Acts chapter 2 is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel the prophet in Joel chapter 2, 28 to 32, where he prophesied that in the last days, said God, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And upon all flesh because prior to Pentecost or the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the spirit was given to a limited number of individuals, individuals such as the prophet, the priest, and the kings. They were the ones who were anointed by the Spirit. But now Joel is saying, in the last days, the Spirit is going to be for freely poured out without discrimination, without partiality, and everybody who are saved and believed in Jesus Christ has the option to be filled with the Spirit, or the opportunity rather than the option to be filled with the Spirit. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord and in one place. And, and Pentecost, of course, for us as Pentecostals, means that we obviously believe in the outpouring of the Spirit and that all those individuals who are born again should be seeking to be filled with the Spirit. According to William T. George, in his book, What God Expects of Me, he said, speaking of salvation, he says, salvation is the greatest spiritual experience that any person can have. Once you are saved, however, it is the will of God for us to be filled with His Holy Spirit. And uh, when we talk about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, essentially we are talking about the same person, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And a gentleman by the name of Ernest Gross Sr., speaking about the necessity for being filled with the Spirit, he puts it this way. He says, religion without the Holy Spirit 
is like an automobile without gasoline. It has to be pushed everywhere it goes. And, and, and that ties in nicely into what we've just read in Acts 1 verse 8, that you shall receive power or the dunamis or the dynamite in the English word. You will receive that which will give you a divine enablement, gives you the power, the authority to carry out the work of the ministry more effectively. You know, the Church of God teaching our declaration of faith reminds us that declaration number eight and nine states that we believe in the baptism with the Holy Ghost subsequent to a clean heart. And nine reminds us that we believe in the speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance and that it is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So it is a, it is a fundamental uh, belief of us Pentecostals that those who are born again should be filled with the Spirit and that speaking in tongues is one of the evidence. It's not the only evidence, as I will explain later, is one of the evidence or the first or initial evidence of one being filled with the Spirit. Speaking of um, Pentecostals, Obviously, I'd like to just make the distinction between the traditional Pentecostals, which is what we are coming from the 18th century, our brand of Pentecostalism, as opposed to the neo-Pentecostal uh, movement or the charismatic movement, which be begins around the, the year 1960. We are coming from the Azusa Street um, brand of Pentecostalism. And I won't spend too much time on that, but just to say that's who we are, the traditional Pentecostals coming out of the holiness movement um, and in the 1901 where the Holy Spirit was poured out uh, in various um, places but essentially just to remind us that we, are, we have charisma, but we are more than just being charismatic. We are traditional Pentecostal people. So the outline for today's sermon message is what is the difference between being converted and being filled with the Spirit? And number two, what is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And three, why is the baptism of the Holy Spirit given to the believer? And four, what are the requirements for receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And finally, what are some of the symbols of the Spirit? And the answer to these questions will be vitally important to our spiritual growth, maturity, and service. Learning what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit will lead us into new depths of our experience with God. So let's look at the first point. What is the difference between being converted and being filled with the Spirit? It is one thing, obviously, to be... It is one thing to experience conversion, and it is quite another thing to be filled with the Spirit. Now, there's a verse in Romans 8, verse 9, which a lot of people misinterpret and it and it, and and it, and it can be very controversial and it says but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit so be it that if that the spirit of god dwells in you now if any man have not the spirit of christ he is none of his and i want to just stop to explain that every person who, who is born again have the spirit of god in them because it is the Spirit of God who is active in conversion. That is part of his ministry in today's world. The Holy Spirit is the one who applies the work of redemption to the life of the individual. So every person who is saved has the Spirit. However, there is an additional blessing that is available 
to the Christian believer, and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And another text that I'd like to just mention before I go further is where Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There are also some controversy or misinterpretation, misunderstanding of that scripture. Some people interpret that to mean water baptism, and they will tell you that I've been baptized already and I won't get baptized a second time. That text in Ephesians 4 verse 5 has nothing to do with water baptism, but rather to do with the Holy Spirit baptizing every believer into the body of Christ. That's how we become converted. That's how we become adopted into the family of God. That's how we become born again. So that is what Paul is talking about, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Baptism into the body of Christ. I hope that is helpful. The Holy Spirit is referred to at various times as the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Ghost. There is no difference in these designations. They all refer to the same person. It is absolutely clear that every person who is born again is indwelt by the Spirit, but the Bible also teaches that it is necessary to be filled and that this infilling is an experience separate and apart from conversion. So it's one thing to be converted. It is quite separate to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The second point of this message then is, what is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Number one, which is what we believe, as I quote to you earlier from declaration number nine, that we believe in the spe in, in baptism of the Holy Ghost and that speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism. And, and this is obviously based on scripture. If you go to the book of Acts chapter 2, our base text, you will see that when the disciples were, or the apostles and the disciples was being filled with the Spirit, they all spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So that's the evidence, Acts 2 verse 4. If you go to the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 46 and 47, at the conversion of the first Gentile Christian Cornelius, when Peter went to his house to pray with him and he teach them the word of God, they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And that convinced Peter that there was no discrimination when it comes to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. He says, now I know for sure that God is no respecter of person because upon the Gentiles also the Holy Spirit has been poured out. And, and it reads, he says, and they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost just as well as we? Because of course, Peter is a Jew, was a Jew, Cornelius and his household are Gentiles. And so he realized that there is no, no discrimination. There is no separation. There is neither Jew nor Gentiles, bond nor free, but everybody who comes to Christ is on an equal footing. The third passage in Acts chapter 19 and verse number 6, where the Apostle Paul and Apollos arrive at Ephesus and found some disciples there and asked them the question, have ye received the Holy Ghost since you were converted? And uh, they said, no, we didn't know that there is such a thing as the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in verse 6 of Acts 19, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance or and prophesied. They speak with other tongues and prophesied. Um, everywhere in Scripture, 
where the Holy Spirit's been poured out, it is always accompanied by speaking in tongues. And I've demonstrated that for you in Acts 2, chapter 2, in Acts chapter 10, and in Acts chapter 19. The, another result of being filled with the Spirit, the evidence is, of course, power for service, additional power for service. And it doesn't mean that you can't be a witness for Christ and you can't work for God without being filled with the Spirit. But what it means is when you are filled with the Spirit, the Spirit enables you to be more effective and to be more efficient in that which you do for the kingdom. So the purpose or the evidence is that it should produce power for service. A, a second or a third thing that it should do, it should increase ministry activity. We see that with the disciples in, in Mark 16 and verse 20, the Bible says, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And you know, Jesus also uh, said about increased activity in ministry in John 14 when he talked about when I go away, the works that I do, when the Holy Spirit come, the works that I do, you will do also and greater works than these. And I often ask myself the question, well, what are the greater works that we can do that Jesus didn't do? There are no new miracles. All the things that we can do in today's world, Jesus did. I think the difference is that he's talking about productivity, greater volume, greater volume of work. Not new miracles, not new work, but greater volume. Why? Why greater volume? Well, because, of course, Jesus was limited to space and time when he was in his humanity. And it's important to remember that all the things that Jesus did while on earth, he didn't do it in his divinity. He did it as the Son of Man anointed by the Spirit. You know, the Bible says in Acts 10, 38, I believe it is, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and he went around doing good, healing the sick and all of those things. So it's important to understand that the, the miracles that Jesus did, all of those things he did as a human being who was anointed by the Spirit. So the baptism of the Spirit, the evidence of the baptism of the Spirit in the life of the believer should be increased ministry activity. Ministry activity. Acts 2 and verse 46, 47 says, speaking of the, the disciples, it says, And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And when you go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 4 through 8, the Bible also says that therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And Philip, a layman, the Bible says he went to the city of Samaria and preached unto the gospel. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits cry out with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and they and and many taken with palsies, and there were and many were lame, were healed, and there was great joy in that city. So when you are filled with the Spirit, it's supposed to result in increased ministry activity, more, with more efficiency and with more effectiveness and with more drive and with more determination. It's, it's not just business as usual. The Holy Spirit comes to empower us and make us more effective. Something else that should result from the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the ability to hold on in prayer, to hold on in prayer. And, and, and Romans 8 verse 26 reminds us that the Holy Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what 
we should pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And Jude reminds us that, but he, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit helps us to build our prior life and to be able to hold on in, in prior or to push, as somebody said, to pray until something happens. So, so let's be clear that speaking in tongues is only one of the signs. There are other things that suppose to happen, as I've just explained to you. Speaking tongues is only one part of it. It should give us power for service. It should increase ministry activity, and it should also enable us to be able to hold on in prayer. Why then, why then is the baptism of the Holy Spirit given to the believers? Well, we know, as I said just now, that the, in the first place it empowers us um, for service, but also the Holy Spirit guides us and directs us in ministry and in our everyday life. The Holy Spirit is there. He guides us and He directs us. The other thing that He does is the Holy Spirit teaches us. That's part of the, the, the reason He's given. He teaches us and He prays through us, as I said earlier. And the Holy Spirit also is the distributor of gifts. He gives gifts. You know, um, the, the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 or the gifts in the book of Romans or the gifts in the book of Ephesians, those are distributed by the Holy Spirit. And, and of course, those are given for the benefit of the body of Christ so that you would have a more efficient church when the gifts of the Spirit are operational within that. So the Spirit also give gifts. The, the Spirit helps us. Amen. The Spirit also reminds us and brings things back to our memory. The Spirit do all of those things for the believers, and that's why it is so critical that we should be filled with the Spirit. Let me move on to uh, point number four. What are the requirements? What are the requirements for receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, we know that Jesus teaches that the Holy Spirit is not for the unconverted. He, the, the language Jesus used is that even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. But we know that the Holy Spirit is for those who are born again. So that's the first thing. He fills those lives that are clean, those who are converted, those who are born again, those who experience redemption. The Holy Spirit also, He fills those who crave after Him, those who desire Him, those who are hungry for Him. Like the scripture reminds us that blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Or as the psalmist says, as the heart panted after the water brook, so panted my soul after thee, O God. Truly, he says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before him? So, so the issue is that you have to create that thirst. You have to create that desire. You have to reach out in prayer and in fasting and in studying the word and in dedicating one's life in order for you to be filled with the Spirit. It's not automatic. It's not automatic. There's some things that we have to do in terms of preparation, preparing our hearts for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So he filled those Christians that are clean. He fills those Christians that are obedient. And, you know, I always say that, you know, gifts are wrapped in obedience. A lot of the things that are promises to us in Scripture is, if you do this, then I will do that. They have strings attached to them. So if you are somebody who is disobedient, if you are somebody who wants to be filled with the Spirit for the wrong reason, then of course it's going to be a challenge, it's going to be difficult. So it's important that all of these things are in place, that there is a reason why 
you get the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit also, he testifies of Jesus. The Holy Spirit reproves. The Holy Spirit guides the believer. So there's a lot of benefits to be received from being filled with the Spirit. And I want to encourage every believer today, every Christian believer who is listening to this sermon, this message, that you would create a divine thirst. Don't become satisfied with where you are. Become unsatisfied with where you are in your spiritual life and realizing that there is a, there is a deeper blessing, there is an additional blessing that I can obtain, which is called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And my final uh, point uh, today is what are the symbols of the Spirit? Now we know there are several things that are symbolic of the Spirit. One of those things is the dove. That's the first one. The dove which is just like in Matthew chapter 3 verse 16. That dove came down at the baptism of Jesus. The Bible says in verse 16, and, when, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and resting upon him. So dove is, is a symbol of the Spirit. Fire is another symbol of the Spirit. Matthew 3, verse 11, John the Baptist, in his preaching, he preached and he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And, and, and that fire, you know, what does, what does fire do? It illuminates, doesn't it? And it purifies. It has a, it has a purpose. And that's what the, the Holy Spirit does when he comes in the life. He illuminates our mind and he purifies the life. Oil is another symbol of the Spirit. And, and what does oil do? Uh, it comforts. It, it soothes. It heals the wounds. It, it's also used for, as, uh, for consecrating the believer. It also gives joy. It is used for healing. And we could go on. So, so this, the, those symbols of the Spirit, they're symbolic and they have real meaning in the life of the believer. And then the, the Spirit, another symbol of the Spirit is rain and dew. Rain and dew. Another symbol of the Spirit is the seal. The seal, John 6, 27, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, him that God the Father hath sealed. So the Holy Spirit is also a seal. The Holy Spirit, uh, or a symbol of the Holy Spirit, is a voice, a voice guiding. We just said earlier on that he guides, he guides us into, into the truth of God's word. He speaks to us, isn't it? He warns us. And all of those things are things that the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer. Another symbol of the Spirit is water. Water. And you, we all know that we can't, just as how we can't live in the natural without water. So it is in the spiritual. We really can't live effectively or at the level that we should be without the water of the Spirit, the water of the Spirit, which comes in abundance, which is always flowing, which is given birth, which is used for cleansing, which is freely given, you know. So the water is also refreshing. And thank God for the refreshing of the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage everybody that you are missing out. You are missing out and a great blessing if you're not filled with the Spirit. You are living beyond what, where you should be. You're living under privilege, we could say. I, often, I, I once described um, the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the differences ma it makes. It's like somebody driving a Rolls Royce in comparison to somebody driving a Mini. 
There is no comparison. So when you, when you are filled with the Spirit, you operate at a smoother and at a higher and at a better level and with much more efficiency. Amen. Amen. I pray that you will crave all of these blessings that is promised to you as the believer. And so I will close today with, with, a, with the quote that says that he who has the spirit in his in his sorry, he who has the spirit in his heart and the scripture in his hand has everything he needs. The Holy Spirit enables us to live for Christ and to be a witness to the world. And it is my prayer that as a Pentecostal church, we will seek to place more emphasis on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I encourage every believer to seek for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It will make a major difference in your life. It will be a revolution in your Christianity if you become filled with the Spirit and you will find that you will have much more drive, much more passion, much more enthusiasm. You will have much more get up and go to do the business of the kingdom of God. And the primary business of the kingdom of God is for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And those who repent and is baptized shall be saved, and those who do not repent shall be damned. And that's, a, that's our responsibility, to ensure that those around us hear the gospel, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit will enable us to be effective in doing so. I pray that these words will find a place in our hearts to dwell, and that it will stir your spirit, stir your desire, and that you will want to reach out for more of God. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for your words. I want to thank you for every listener. I pray that your word today, God, would find a place in our hearts. It would reprove us. It would correct us. It would instruct us. And those who have listened to me today sharing your words, Lord, you would create that hunger, that thirst, that ambition, that desire in their hearts for more of you. I pray that you will bless the word and I pray that it will germinate and it will produce fruit and for every person that are seeking to be filled with the spirit I pray that you will give them wisdom give them increased faith give them understanding and create that holy desire in their hearts for more of you we thank you bless you and praise you for your words and I pray father that it will now go into the hearts of your people and produce fruit some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you real good. Thank you for listening to me today. God bless.